Flowering plants or angiosperms are one of the most diverse groups of plants found on our planet. Although there are variations in their external structure or morphology, all of them are characterized by the presence of roots, stems, leaves, flowers and fruits. The portion of a flowering plant above the ground is termed as the shoot system, while the portion below the ground is termed as the root system. The root system provides proper anchorage to the plant. It helps in the synthesis of plant growth regulators and is responsible for the absorption of water and minerals from the soil to different parts of the plant. From the tip upwards, a root has a root cap, a region of meristematic activity, a region of elongation and a region of maturation along with root hairs. The root cap is a sheath of cells present at the tip of the root that protects the root while entering the soil. The region of meristematic activity is just above the root cap where the cells are very tiny and rapidly divide to produce new cells for growth. The region of elongation has cells that undergo rapid enlargement and elongation that causes the root to grow in length. The region of maturation has elongated cells that differentiate and mature. The primary tissues and root hairs develop here. The root hairs are fine delicate structures that emerge from the region of maturation and assist in the absorption of water and minerals for the plant from the soil. There are various kinds of roots in flowering plants. In dicotyledonous plants like mustard, radish and carrot, the embryonic root or radical grows into the soil to form the primary root. Multiple lateral roots called secondary roots emerge from the primary root. These secondary roots further branch into tertiary roots. The primary root along with its branches forms the taproot system. In monocotyledonous plants like wheat and coconut, the primary root is short-lived and is replaced by a network of many large and small roots originating from the base of the stem. This network of roots forms the fibrous root system. These fibrous roots spread laterally and do not penetrate deep into the soil, unlike tap roots. There are some plants like monstera and grass which have roots that do not arise from the radical. The roots emerge from various other parts of the plant like the stem or the leaf. These roots are known as adventitious roots. Some roots also modify themselves to perform specific functions for the plant. For example, the adventitious root in a sweet potato swells up and stores food for the plant. Similarly, in banyan trees, the modified adventitious roots, also known as prop roots, help support the tree. In plants like sugarcane and maize, the roots emerge from the lower node of the stem to support the plant. These roots are called stilt roots. Roots also modify themselves to help get oxygen for respiration. Such roots are called pneumatophores and are seen in plants like rhizophora that grow in swampy areas. Therefore, the root system forms an important part of a flowering plant.
A stem is a plant organ that develops from the plumule of a germinating seed. It is the main axis or stalk of a plant. It is usually green in color when young and slowly turns brown. The stem bears branches, leaves, buds, flowers and fruits. The buds growing on the stem can be either axillary or terminal. A stem usually has many nodes and internodes. A node is a region from where leaves, flowers, branches or cones emerge, while an internode is the portion between two nodes. As the stem grows, many lateral buds emerge, which grow into lateral branches. These branches further develop other lateral shoots called twigs or branchlets. Now, let's learn about the functions of a stem. The stem, along with its branches, hold the leaves, buds, flowers and fruits. It transports water, minerals and photosynthates between the roots and the shoots. Apart from these functions, the stems of many plants get modified to perform functions like storing food, providing support, protection and aiding vegetative propagation. A modified stem quite often looks different in structure from a normal stem. Underground stems of some plants like potato, turmeric, ginger, and colocasia are modified for storing food. Moreover, stems modified to store food help the plant to tide over unfavorable conditions of growth. In some plants like watermelon and grape, slender and spirally coiled stem tendrils emerge from axillary buds. The stem tendrils are modified stems that help the plant to climb. Sometimes, the axillary buds on the stem get modified into straight, woody and pointed thorns, which protect the plant from pasturing animals. Plants like bougainvillea, lemon and orange are typical examples where the axillary buds get modified into thorns. In plants like jasmine and mint, slender lateral branches arise from the base of the main stem. Initially, these branches grow aerially. Later, they bend to touch the ground and form a new plant. Therefore, these modified stems help in vegetative reproduction. Plants like pineapple and banana also have modified stems that perform vegetative reproduction. In these plants, branches grow out horizontally from the underground base portion of the main stem, which later emerge obliquely out of the soil in the form of leafy shoots. In arid regions, it is common to see plants with flattened or fleshy cylindrical stems. These are modified stems that contain chlorophyll and perform photosynthesis. Did you know that many flattened or fleshy cylindrical stems have thorns on them that help to deflect sun rays and maintain the moisture content? In some plants like grass and strawberry, some stems get modified and grow underground. These underground stems spread to new niches and form new plants as the old ones die. Certain aquatic plants like Pistia and Econia also have modified stems with short internodes. The nodes of these plants have clusters of leaves and small bunches of hair-like roots, which help the plant to stay afloat. The stem, therefore, is one of the main structural axes of a plant apart from the root. In most plants, the stem grows above the soil surface, 
but in a few of them, it grows underground. A leaf is a plant organ that exists above the ground and is specialized to carry out the process of photosynthesis. Leaves develop at the node of a stem and generally have a flat and lateral structure. Moreover, they are arranged in an acropital order. In other words, they develop in succession from the base to the apex of a stem or a branch. Leaves originate from shoot apical meristems and bear buds in their axil. These auxiliary buds later grow into branches. The meristem found at the tip of a shoot is known as shoot apical meristem. A typical leaf has three main parts leaf base, petiole, and lamina. The leaf is attached to the stem by the leaf base and may bear two lateral, small leaf-like structures called stipules. In some leguminous plants, the base of the leaf may get swollen, which is known as pulvinus. The petiole helps the leaf to tilt in the direction of light. If the petiole is long and slender, it helps the leaf to move in the air and bring fresh air to the surface. The lamina is the expanded green portion of a leaf. However, its shape, apex, surface, margin, and extent of incision vary from plant to plant. The lamina also has many veins and veinlets running through it. Usually, the lamina has a prominent vein running through its center called the midrib. The arrangement of veins and veinlets in a leaf blade or lamina is called venation. Venation is of two types, reticulate and parallel. In reticulate venation, the veins within the lamina form a network, a characteristic that is common to dicotyledonous plants. In parallel venation, the veins run parallel to each other, a characteristic typical to monocotyledonous plants. The primary functions of the veins are to transport water, minerals, and food, and provide rigidity to the lamina. Based on the structure of the lamina, leaves are classified as simple and compound. The lamina of a simple leaf is usually entire. However, when it is incised, the incisions do not touch the midrib. On the other hand, in compound leaves, the incisions reach the midrib and break it into several leaflets. Both simple and compound leaves have a bud in the axil of their petiole. However, buds do not develop in the axil of the leaflets of a compound leaf. Compound leaves are further classified into pinnately and palmately compound leaves. In pinnately compound leaves, there are several leaflets on the common axis or the rachis. The rachis is the midrib of the leaf. In palmately compound leaves, all the leaflets are attached to a common point, which is the tip of the petiole. Apart from classifying leaves as simple and complex, they are also identified as opposite, alternate, or hauled on the basis of their pattern of arrangement on a stem or a branch. This is termed as phylotaxy. In opposite phylotaxy, there are two leaves on one node arranged opposite to each other, as in 
Calotropis and Guava. In alternate phyllotaxy, only one leaf arises at each node and the leaf at the next node is in the opposite direction. Alternate phyllotaxy is seen in plants like hibiscus and sunflower. Finally, in walled phyllotaxy, two or more leaves appear at a node forming a wall as seen in Alstonia. A leaf has many functions. Apart from the primary function of photosynthesis, leaves sometimes get modified to perform functions like storing food, synthesizing food, trapping and digesting food, and providing support and protection. For example, the fleshy leaves of onion and garlic store food. Another plant, the Australian acacia, has petioles that expand, turn green and synthesize food. Also, certain insectivorous plants like the Venus flytrap and the pitcher plant have modified leaves that help capture tiny insects which are food for these plants. These insects are digested by the enzymes secreted by the modified leaves. In the pea plant, some leaves get modified into tendrils which help the plant to climb. Whereas in many cacti, the leaves are modified into spines for protection. Leaves, therefore, are an important part of a plant. Apart from carrying out the chief function of photosynthesis, it stores food and provides protection and support in many plants. A flower is the most beautiful and attractive part of a plant that contributes to the process of reproduction. Typically, a flower has four main walls. Calyx, Corolla, Andricium, and Gynecium. These walls are arranged on the swollen end of a stalk called the thalamus or the receptacle. The outermost wall is the calyx, consisting of sepals. The next inner wall is the corolla, consisting of petals. Both calyx and corolla are accessory walls or non-essential walls of a flower. While the calyx protects the flower in its bud stage, the corolla helps to attract insects and birds for the purpose of pollination. In some plants, such as the lily, both the calyx and the corolla are fused to form the perianth. The wall inner to the corolla is the andricium, consisting of stamens, which are the male reproductive organs. The innermost wall is the gynecium, consisting of one or more carpels, which are the female reproductive organs. Both the andricium, gynecium, are the reproductive organs of a flower. They are also called the essential walls of a flower. Flowers can be either bisexual or unisexual. A bisexual flower has both andricium and gynecium, while a unisexual flower has either andricium or Gynecium. 
flowers can also be either asymmetrical or symmetrical based on the arrangement of floral parts around the thalamus. An asymmetrical flower cannot be divided into two similar halves by any vertical plane that passes through its center. While a symmetrical flower can be divided into similar halves. Symmetrical flowers can be subdivided into two types. Actinomorphic and zygomorphic. An actinomorphic flower can be divided into similar halves in any radial plane that passes through its center. While a zygomorphic flower can be divided into two similar halves only by a single vertical plane that passes through its axis. Flowers are also classified as trimerous, tetramerous, or pentamerous based on the number of flowering parts like sepals, petals, and stamens. Trimerous flowers have flowering parts in sets of three, while tetramerous flowers have them in sets of four and pentamerous flowers in sets of five. Some flowers have reduced leaves at the base of the thalamus known as bracts and are commonly called bracteates. These bracts are absent in some flowers known as ebracteates. Based on the position of the gynesium with respect to the calyx, corolla and andresium on the thalamus, flowers are described as hypogenous, perigenous and epigenous. When the gynesium is at the highest position on the thalamus with respect to the calyx, corolla and the andresium, the flower is said to be a hypogenous flower. Such flowers are said to have a superior ovary. Common examples are brinjal and mustard. When the genesium is at the center of the thalamus and all the other parts are on its rim, the flower is called a perigenous flower. The ovary in these flowers is said to be half inferior. Rose and peach are typical examples of perigenous flowers. However, in some flowers, the ovary is completely enclosed within the thalamus and is fused within it, while all the other parts appear above the ovary. Such flowers are called epigenous and their ovary is said to be inferior. Sunflower and guava are epigenous flowers. The arrangement of flowers on the floral axis is called inflorescence. Depending on whether the apex of the floral axis is converted into a flower or continues to grow, two major types of inflorescences are defined, racemos and cymos. In racemos inflorescence, the flowers appear laterally in acropetal succession that is from the base to the top of the main axis therefore the main axis or stalk continues to grow at the tip however in cymos inflorescence the flowers appear in basipetal order or grow in succession from the apex to the base of the main axis. Here, the main axis ends in a flower and further development takes place by the growth of lateral branches. Therefore, 
Apart from being the most beautiful and attractive part of a plant, a flower contributes to the process of reproduction and helps in the perpetuation of species. A flower is the most beautiful and attractive part of a plant that contributes to the process of reproduction. Typically, a flower has four walls, calyx, corolla, andresium, and gynesium. The outermost wall is the calyx, which consists of sepals that are green, leaf-like structures that protect the flower in its bud stage. The sepals can be either free or united. When free, the calyx is called polysepalous, and when united, the calyx is called gamosepalous. The next inner wall is the corolla, which consists of petals that are usually thin and soft. There is a wide variety in the color and shape of the corolla. It can be in the shape of a wheel, funnel or bell and is sometimes tubular. The primary function of the corolla is to attract insects and birds for pollination. Like the calyx, the petals of the corolla can be either united or free. When united, the corolla is called gamopetalous and when free, it is called polypetalous. The arrangement of the sepals and petals also characterizes a flower. The positional arrangement of the sepals and petals with respect to other members of the same wall within a flower bud is called estivation. Estivation is of many types. However, the main ones are valvate, twisted, imbricate, and vexillary. In valvate estivation, the sepals or petals within a wall touch each other at the margin with no overlapping, while in twisted estivation, one sepal or petal overlaps that of the next one, and so on. In imbricate estivation, the margins of the sepals or petals overlap one another, but in no particular direction. And finally, in vexillary estivation, each sepal or petal covers the sepal or petal that is within it. Now let's learn about andresium, the wall inner to the corolla. The andresium consists of stamens which are the male reproductive organs of a flower. Generally, each stamen has a stalk called the filament and an anther at the tip. The anther usually has two lobes, each with two chambers, which are the pollen sacs. The pollen sacs contain pollen grains. A stamen that is sterile is called a staminode. Moreover, the filaments of a stamen can be of different lengths as in mustard and salvia. The stamens can also be attached to each other or to other parts of the flower. For example, in the mustard flower, the stamens are epipetalous or are attached to the petals, while in the lily, the stamens are epiphyllous or are attached to the perianth. Stamens can also remain free or polyandrous as in lily or united in varying degrees as in china rose, the pea plant and citrus plants. In china rose, the stamens are united into one bundle and are called monoadelphus. In the pea flower, the stamens are grouped into two bundles and are called diadelphus. And in the lemon flower, 
The stamens are grouped into more than two bundles and are known as polyadelphus. Now the innermost wall is the gynecium. It consists of one or more carpels which are the female reproductive organs of a flower. The carpels can be either fused or free. For example, in tomato and mustard, the carpels are fused and are called syncarpus, while in rose and lotus, the carpels are free and are called apocarpus. Each carpel has three parts, stigma, style and ovary. The stigma is the part of the carpel that receives the pollen grains. The style is the elongated tube that lies on the ovary and connects it to the stigma. An ovary is the enlarged basal part and bears one or more ovules which are attached to a placenta that is soft and flat. Once fertilization takes place, the ovules form the seeds and the ovary develops into the fruit. The arrangement of ovules within an ovary is called placentation. There are different types of placentation. Axil, parietal, basal, free or central and marginal. In axial placentation, the placenta is axial and the ovules are attached to it in a multilocular ovary as in lemon and tomato. In parietal placentation, the ovary is initially single chambered. A false septum later develops and divides it into two chambers. The ovules develop on the peripheral or inner wall of the ovary. Parietal placentation is seen in plants such as cucumber and melons. When the placenta develops at the base of the ovary and a single ovule is attached to it, the placentation is called basal placentation. This is seen in marigold and sunflower. In free or central placentation, septa are absent and the ovules develop on the central axis as seen in primrose and dianthus. Finally, in marginal placentation, along the ventral suture of the ovary, the placenta forms a ridge. The ovules are born on this ridge in two rows as seen in the pea plant. The calyx, corolla, andricium, and gynecium are the four walls of a flower. The calyx and the corolla are the accessory walls, while the andricium and the gynecium are the reproductive organs. The word fruit makes one think of an apple, banana, Or a mango. However, in biology, the term fruit has a much broader meaning. It is a fertilized ovary with seeds. However, certain fruits are formed without fertilization of the ovary and are therefore seedless. Such fruits are called parthenocarpic fruits, such as seedless watermelon, banana, and orange. Parthenocarpy can be a natural process or may be artificially induced. Once fertilization takes place in a flower, the ovary ripens to form the fruit and the ovules form the seeds. Typically, a fruit is made up of two parts, the pericarp and the seed. The pericarp is the fruit wall and it can be thick and fleshy as in mango or dry as in hazelnut. In the mango, the pericarp is differentiated into three distinct layers. The epicarp, which is the outermost layer or peel, 
the mesocarp, which is the thick, pulpy middle layer, and the endocarp, which is the innermost layer that directly surrounds the seed. Fruits such as mango and peach are also called droops. Droops are single-seeded fleshy fruits that develop from monocarpillary superior ovaries. Apart from the pericarp, the other part of a fruit is the seed. Based on the number of cotyledons, the seeds of flowering plants are classified as dicotyledonous and monocotyledonous. A seed with two cotyledons is called dicotyledonous and with a single cotyledon is called monocotyledonous. In a dicotyledonous seed, the outermost covering is the seed coat and is made up of two layers, the outer tester and the inner tegmen. The seed coat also has a scar on its surface called the hilum, which helps attach the seed to the fruit. Above the hilum is the micropyle, a small pore in the outer coat of the seed. It is through the micropyle that the pollen tube enters an ovule. Inside the seed coat lies the embryo, which comprises an embryonal axis and two cotyledons. At the two ends of the embryonal axis lie the plumule and the radical. The cotyledons are often fleshy and store reserve food materials. In some seeds, such as castor, the developing embryo is surrounded by a nutritive tissue called the endosperm, which stores food and helps the embryo grow. Seeds with endosperm are called endospermic. Whereas in seeds like mango, the endosperm is absent, such seeds are called non-endospermic. Like dicotyledonous seeds, the outermost covering of monocotyledonous seeds is also known as the seed coat. For example, the maize seed has a membranous seed coat that is usually fused with the fruit wall. Moreover, like dicotyledonous seeds, monocotyledonous seeds can be endospermic as in maize or non-endospermic as in cymodocea. The endosperm of maize is bulky and stores food, while the embryo is tiny and is placed in a grove at one end of the endosperm. The embryo is separated from the endosperm by a proteinous layer known as the aleurone layer and is made up of a single large shield-shaped cotyledon called the scutellum. The embryo also has a short axis with a plumule and a radical. The plumule is enclosed by a sheath called the coleoptil and the radical by a sheath called the coleoriza. Thus, seeds are formed from the ovules and help in reproduction, while a fruit is formed from the ovary and is the characteristic feature of flowering plants. Technical descriptions of plants are very useful in the study of floral morphology and help taxonomists in the easy identification and classification of plants. The technical description of a flowering plant must be expressed in scientific language and must be simple, brief and sequential. The description starts with the vegetative characters of the plant, such as the type of roots, stem and leaves. This is followed by a description of its floral characters and flowering parts, such as sepals, petals, stamens and carpels. The description of vegetative and floral characters is followed by a floral formula and floral diagram, which represent the floral description in condensed form. The floral formula is represented by a set of symbols and provides information about a flower such as its symmetry, sex, 
Calyx, Corolla, Perianth, Andricium, Gynesium, Bracts, Bracteoles, Staminodes, Pistilodes, and the number of sepals, Petals, Stamens, and Carpels. The formula also explains cohesion and adhesion within parts of walls and in between the walls with the help of symbols. Some of the symbols used to represent the different parts of a flower and the relationships between these parts are as shown. Let's understand the symbols in the floral formula of a mustard flower. The mustard flower is actinomorphic and bisexual. The calyx has four sepals arranged in two rows and the corolla has four petals. There are six stamens arranged in two rows and the gynesium is bicarpillary and syncarpus with a superior ovary. The floral formula of a flower is usually accompanied by its floral diagram. The floral diagram is a graphical representation of the cross-section of a flower and provides information about the different parts of a flower their arrangement and the relationships between these parts. The outermost wall in the floral diagram is the calyx, followed by the corolla, andricium and gynesium. The floral diagram presents information about a flower such as its sex, symmetry, bracts, bracteoles, the number of floral walls, the calyx, corolla, andricium, and gynesium. Like in the floral formula, various symbols are used while drawing a floral diagram as shown. Thus, the description of a flowering plant provides vital information about the plant. The description begins with the vegetative and floral characteristics and is followed by the floral formula and the floral diagram. Flowering plants or angiosperms are the most diverse group of plants on earth. These plants are categorized into different families based on their morphological characters. Let's describe a few important flowering families. The Fabaceae family, earlier known as Papilionoidea is a subfamily of the Leguminosae family. Plants belonging to this family can be trees, shrubs or herbs and are found all over the world. The roots of these plants have root nodules and their stems are erect or are climbers. Their leaves are alternate and may be simple or pinnately compound. Moreover, the leaf base is pulvinate with stipules and the leaves have reticulate venation. The flowers are arranged in racemose inflorescence and are bisexual and zygomorphic. The calyx has five sepals that are gamma sepalous with imbricate or valvate estivation. The corolla has five petals and is polypetalous. Moreover, the petals are papillionaceous and consist of a posterior standard, two lateral wings and two anterior ones forming a keel. The estivation is descending imbricate or vexillary. In these plants, the andricium consists of ten stamens that are diadelphous with a dithicus anther. The genesium has a superior ovary and is monocarpillary, which means it has just one carpel. The ovary is unilocular with many ovules, and these flowers have a single style. Fruits of this family are legumes with one to many non-endospermic seeds. The floral formula and the floral diagram of the Fabaceae family are as shown. 
The economic importance of plants belonging to the Fabacea family are also many. Gram, Moong and Soya bean are pulses. Soya bean and groundnut produce edible oil. Indigofera is a dye. Sun hemp is a fiber. Sesbania and trifolium are used as fodder. Lupin and sweet pea are ornamental plants. And mulaiti is used as a medicine. Another important family is the Solanaceae family, commonly known as the potato family. Plants belonging to this family are found in the tropics, subtropics and temperate zones. These plants are usually herbs, shrubs and small trees. Their stems are herbaceous, rarely woody, aerial, erect, cylindrical, branched, solid or hollow and hairy or glabrous. Sometimes the stems grow underground as seen in potato. In these plants, the leaves are alternate and simple and are very rarely pinnately compound. Moreover, they are extipulate or without stipules and have reticulate venation. The flowers are arranged in cymos inflorescence or may be solitary or axillary. Moreover, they are bisexual and actinomorphic. The calyx has five sepals, which are united and persistent with valvate estivation. Like the calyx, the corolla also has five petals that are united with valvate estivation. In these plants, the andricium has five stamens and is epipetalous, and the genesium is bicarpillary and syncarpous. The ovary is superior and bilocular, and the placenta is swollen with many ovules. The fruits of these plants are berries or capsules with many endospermic seeds. The floral formula and the floral diagram of the Solanaceae family are as shown. Many plants like tomato, Brinjol and potato, belonging to the Solanaceae family, are used as food. Chili is used as a spice and belladonna and ashwagandha are used as medicines. Tobacco has fumigatory properties and petunia is an ornamental plant. Another important family is the Liliaceae family or the lily family which is a characteristic representative of monocot plants. Plants belonging to this family are perennial herbs with underground bulbs, rhizomes or corms, and these plants are found all over the world. The leaves of these plants are generally basal, alternate and linear. Also, they are extipulate with parallel venation. The inflorescence is either solitary or cymos, usually with umbilate clusters, and the flowers are bisexual and actinomorphic. In these plants, the calyx and the corolla are fused to form the perianth, which has six tepals, usually united into a tube. Also, the perianth has valvate estivation. In the Liliaceae family, the andricium consists of six stamens and the genesium is tricarpillary and syncarpous. The ovary is superior and trilocular with many ovules arranged in axile placentation. Fruits belonging to this family are generally capsules and are rarely berries, while the seeds are endospermous. The floral formula and the floral diagram of the Liliaceae family are as shown. Plants like tulips and gloriosa belonging to the Liliaceae family are ornamental plants. Some like aloe and 
colchicum autumnal are used as medicines and asparagus is used as a vegetable. Therefore, the description of a flowering plant includes its vegetative characters, floral characters, floral formula and floral diagram and provides vital information about the plant.